Welcome listeners to a brand new bonus episode of Oh My Word Podcast. And today we've got a really special treat. We have with us Jerry Fink, who is a best-selling author and founder of Whimsical World. Find out all about that. Jerry, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. We are thrilled and delighted, which probably fits into Whimsical World, but we will discover all about that. So we always start with the origin story of how did we get here, that you become a best-selling author, you're going to be a founder of Whimsical World. What's the story behind all it? Well, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a writer, a teacher, a mother, a princess, and a mermaid. I have the best job ever. As a children's author, I can do all of those things at one time and often do. But I wasn't always on the straight path. Of course, I wrote a lot as a kid, but I was very focused on climbing the corporate ladder and doing well in school. And eventually, once I got to the top of the ladder I was climbing, I realized it was against the wrong wall. And when I was going through this time of soul searching, like if I'm not this person, who am I? Because I'd invested so much of my time and my life into my career like over 12 years, I had a gift of adversity. Mm. And I think a lot of people can relate to it. I was actually being bullied by another woman and I didn't know how to handle it. I did not handle it well at all. I was driving to work one day and I was crying and I had tried everything. Nothing was working to make it better. And I just said, help me, I will do anything. And then I had this light bulb moment of an idea about a rose that grows up in a weed bed and because she's different, thinks that she's a weed. And then that story wrote through me in the car. I was driving to work. Luckily, I had lots of stoplights because I was writing on the back of an envelope with a mini golf pencil car. (laughs) Every stoplight, I was like feverishly writing everything down, just trying to capture it. Something like that had never happened to me before. When I got to work, I was like, wow, that was weird, but awesome. But I'm not going to tell anybody about it because what will people think? So I just put that away. And more than a year later, I pulled it out of the drawer and I decided, you know what, I'm going to do something with this. And I was terrified and I had no idea what I was doing, but I did it anyway. I self-published it. And once I released it, two weeks later, it became a number one bestseller on Amazon. Then it stayed at number one for over 60 weeks. Wow. And it changed everything in my life. So many follow-up questions. (laughs) Wow. First of all, you're talking about 12 years corporate ladder. I guess you were not pursuing being a princess and a mermaid during that time. No, not at all. (laughs) You you graduated, you kind of did the college thing, and you just went into like the regular workforce, nothing to do with creativity or writing or anything. No, not at all. I was doing marketing and for technology brands. I don't know, just very different environments. I called myself the corporate robot. If you needed to get it done, I was your girl. But that didn't really fit me. When everyone's going to look next and they'll go to your website and they'll see your picture with whatever color hair you have that day. And they'll see that like, <laughs> yeah, how did, why was Sherry? Yeah. Actually, it sounds like marketing. She could have helped you now. I don't know if any of that correlates could have paid off, but. I think everything that I learned has paid off. I think my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, everything I did in the corporate world with regard to the marketing job and the business management side of things. You learn a lot when you're climbing the ladder. And I think all of those things came into play, but I had never done anything with books or my own art or creativity. I didn't even know another author way back then. It was crazy how different my life is from then to now. It's a lot more magical. Did you ever think even that you had all the dreams that you were going to be when you were a kid, but as you're getting older and going to college and stuff, was there a part of your brain that still kind of wanted to go to write or that was kind of just something that was shelved for a while? I really wanted to do it, but I was too afraid. I think if I hadn't been pushed, because I was in a pretty cozy nest. I had worked my way up. I had done pretty well for myself, and I was pretty well respected, too. And it's really hard to leave when you have that. If it hadn't happened exactly the way that it did, who knows if I would have had the courage. It happened the way it was meant to. Right. Your rose and your weed. It sounds a little bit like the ugly duckling. Is it similar to that, but just with a rose and weed? Um, A little bit, but the message is really about finding other roses who can appreciate who you are and aren't competing with you. Eventually, the book was actually adapted into a play. It was really cool. I got to see it performed. I flew to Nashville. I took my mom to the premiere. It was amazing. And... In the play version, obviously, there's a lot more roles than in the book. Um, So you have to make a lot more roles for a lot more children. And we didn't want the weeds to be wrong. You know, nobody wants to be the bad guy. So we actually made them have a realization that they were just misguided. So at the end Mm. of it, 
in the play version, the gardener actually goes back to the weeds. And once they show that they've learned their lesson and they actually care about the little rose, she brings them into her garden too. So she lets so, the weeds take over the garden. <laughs> share the space. They mutually respect each other the way that we would hope that people would in yeah. the world. That's actually interesting. It was adapted into a play. Someone contacted you and said, can I make a play out of this? Because it actually does sound like yes. something that could be a good play. Like, it sounds yes, like a that's exactly what happened. Really? Someone that worked at the Library of Congress wrote to me and said, hey, I saw this book. I thought it would be amazing as a play. What do you think? And I was like, I don't know anything about that. And he's like, but I do. I have experience. And I was like, oh. And he's like, what if we co-wrote it? And so we did for a year. He would write an act. He'd send it to me. I would refine it. I'd send it back. We'd go back and forth the whole time. And then when we were finally finished, we decided to submit it to playwriting contests and or at the same time, submit it to publishing companies and we had one take it up it's available now people can go and schools or whoever wants to perform it can search a database and say like anti-bullying or kindness or gardens or whatever keyword they're looking for and they can find the little rose there and they can actually pay a licensing fee to download it and they can perform it wow pretty cool yeah that is pretty cool so The Little Rose is written and you say you didn't know what you were doing, but somehow you got a book out. So what did you do even if you didn't know what you were doing? How did you actually get it out? The first thing I have to do is try to overcome the fear because right. the fear was enormous. I had huge, terrifying fear about having my story out there. I didn't want anybody to know I was bullied. I didn't want anybody to know that it hurt my feelings. You know, even the baseline information was tenuous. I didn't want anybody to know because I was so ashamed of it. But then I realized throughout the process, almost everybody can relate to this experience. And when we share our struggles, it helps other people not only relate to us, but learn how to be in the world themselves. Not because we did the right thing, but because they sometimes learn the wrong thing not to do. It's really made me more connected to other people than I've ever felt before in my life. And I get beautiful letters from people even today saying, oh my gosh, my kid is going through that. My sister went through that. My friend is going through that. It's awful. Like People can be really terrible to each other. And it's really important that we stick together and, and we learn ways to deal with that. And the same thing applies to authors, I think, when we're writing. We have to keep going even though we're afraid. So... That was the biggest thing was the mindset. It was just like, I'm going to help a kid. I'm going to help a kid. I'm just going to help one kid. And then it's going to be all worth it because of that. I always say like plant seeds of self-esteem. That's what I wanted to do. So every day I would do that. And then I'd be like, well, I want to publish a book today. How am I going to do that? What do I do next? So I would research online. And this was back in, I started working on it back in 2010. So there was a lot less information and a lot less options then. And I would just do it. Whatever felt like the right thing, I would just go for it. I'm like, okay, well, what do I need to do? I need to, to write the book. I need to edit the book. I need to find someone to illustrate. I need to find some way to print this book. I need to figure out how to get it on Amazon. What are the bare minimum things? Right. And then I would just steadily misstep my way through those things. <laughs> Once the book was out and successful and people were telling me that it was resonating with them, I had another idea. And at first, I was like, no, no, no. I checked the box. I'm a number one best-selling author. I'm good. And then I was like, no, no. I, this character just kept coming to me. So I sat down and wrote it. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to have two books. Fast forward 10 years later, I have 15 books, wow. mostly in the children's world. But I also have a romance novel. And I have an inspirational journal. And I have a motivational memoir that's kind of a self-help book. So I really love being creative. And now I just follow the inspiration. I don't question it as much as I used to. I feel like every single thing that I do is aligned with self-love. And that's kind of like the heart of everything, whether it's a book that I write or an inspirational talk that I give or school visit. It's all coming back to self-love and putting out really good things into the world. Which is how we get whimsical world. That's right. So while I was doing this career of my dreams, I met the man of my dreams. Oh. We were we were both asked to come to a school on an author festival day. And I think there were like 20, 22 authors and we were two of them. And much, much later, once we were engaged, he told me, I knew that day that I was going to marry you. What? <laughs> I didn't know then. <laughs> 
But anyway, my husband is a successful children's author as well. His name is Derek Taylor Kent. And so we decided to combine both of our imaginations and our brands and create one bigger brand and grow from there. And we call it Whimsical World. And our mission is to inspire and delight kids of all ages while planting seeds of self-esteem and high achievement. And so everything we do falls under that umbrella and branched out. We not only have books, but we have some merchandise like lunch boxes and lip balms and magnets and enamel pins. And I just love it. All the things that I was like, oh, one day when I was at Comic-Con years and years ago, and I was like, wouldn't it be cool to one day have my own lunchbox? Well, now I do. Yay! When you get your own lunchbox, you have arrived. <laughs> So now you work on books together? We're both writers. So we hire illustrators to bring our words to life. And yeah, it's pretty amazing to have someone, you're like, I have this crazy idea. And they're like, oh my gosh, not only should you do that, but you should do it even bigger. Yeah, wow. But yeah, so let's like go back. You're doing research to find out, okay, you have to edit a book. You're doing research, you have to illustrate it, et cetera, et cetera. You got on Amazon, but you got over your fear of writing. You have to get over a fear of telling people you have a book. So it was six months from the day I decided I was going to publish a book till I actually did. Oh, well. Um, okay. And that's fast. Yeah. Yes. But I had to go fast because if I didn't, I knew I was going to chicken out. I was terrified. Like I said, every day I was scared and I had to try not to let that slow me down. Being able to tell people about your book, that is a whole nother level, like yes. you said. Even now, I feel a little bit shy. I have fun on podcasts and in interviews and whatever. But if I'm like at around a table with five other people, I don't really want to talk about me. I don't want to talk about the books. I'd much rather hear about other people. Yeah. I already know about me. What I would do is I would go to these local business meetings and I would stand there. When it was my turn, I would say, hi, I'm Cherry Fink, and I want to publish a book that helps kids with their self-esteem. Do you know anyone who might know anything about this process? My knees would be shaking under the table, but I would ask, and then I would go on to LinkedIn, and I would, back in my corporate career, I've always been a connector. So like, if I find out that you love the Met, and I know someone who works there, and you're going to be in New York, I would be like, oh, let me introduce you to my friend. And that's just naturally who I am. I've always had fun bringing joy to other people that way. So I never asked for anything in the corporate world. So when I was about to do this project, I reached out to people and I was so scared because I didn't want to be a burden on them or make, yeah. have expectations of me or whatever. But I reached out because I was so passionate about helping kids. And I said, this is what I'm trying to do. Do you know anyone who might know something? about this or has done this before do you know any other authors do you know any other children's authors or you know anything and I had a few people write back and say oh you should meet my friend so-and-so or I think I know someone who knows someone and I would talk to those people I would ask for 15 minutes of their time and I was very strict about it I didn't want to make them feel like I was taking advantage of them in any way and I would say what did you do that worked what did you do that didn't work what would you do differently and who else should I talk to most of the folks were very kind and were, were like, oh, you know, it's okay. We can talk a little longer. And I sent a follow-up thank you letter to them, like actual card in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> then when the book became available on Amazon, I sent an email out to each of them, a personal email saying, thank you again for your words of wisdom. I'm so excited and nervous. My book is actually on Amazon and I included the link. Well, unbeknownst to me, several of them had shared that out on social media oh, before wow. I even fully understand it, how it works. Yeah. That I think is how it hit number one. And then it stayed there because of word of mouth. Then I was started doing events after that. And the more events that you do, the more people that you meet, the better your sales are. And when you go on vacation or do something else or like have a baby like I just did and you're not out there in the world constantly, sometimes your sales will drop a little bit. But getting out there and I got more and more confident. It used to be like when I'd have a podcast, I'd be so scared. I'd ask for all the questions up front. I would write my answers out. I would read them. My very first ones are terrible because I'm not speaking from the heart. I don't have the organic flow. Now I just follow the lead and I have so much more fun. First of all, we should say, and I know this is totally biased, authors in general are really nice people. I agree. I just have to put a plug in there for us. I'd say most of the authors I've met, authors, illustrators, book people, most of the people I've met in this world have been really, really nice people. Yeah, we know how hard it is. So we yeah, have a yeah, lot of yeah. empathy for each other. As you were going through the publication process and things like that, you said that you self-published. Did you have a thought at all to try to send out to agents, get in with the bigger publishers, or you kind of felt you had to kind of be in control of the process? I thought about it, 
and I attended a writer's conference. So I'm very good about seeking out experts when I want to do something. I want to learn from people who are happy and successful at it. If you don't have both, I don't want your advice, right? Like, Because <laughs> I need both to be fulfilled. And that's more important to me is fulfillment. I went to this writer's conference and I listened to these speakers who were best-selling authors in different genres. And I was very shy back then. I think a lot of authors were really, at heart, introverts. And I was definitely that way. I felt like an imposter just even being at the writer's conference. I had nothing, you know, that I felt like was worth publishing at the time. And I would ask people offstage after their talk, just the two of us, if you had to do it over again, what would you do differently between the two of us? And right. they would always look over their shoulder and they would say, I'd do it myself. Huh. Some of them were in the process of buying back their rights. Some of them were mired in lawsuits about things with their publishers. And ah, it was a mess. One had an opportunity to do a TV series, but the publisher killed the deal. And like, it was just like ugly, ugly, ugly mess. Oh. And I was thinking, you know, I didn't go through all this corporate nonsense just to be in more of that. Yeah. Like, and I really, honestly, I was very afraid of rejection. I was like, well, what if the agents don't see my vision? What if they illustrate it in a way that isn't my vision? I really wanted to have creative integrity. It was like the first big thing I was putting out into the world. And I was willing to take the risk. As a kid, I was very creative. I was always making up my own little stories and illustrating my own books. And I had all these little businesses that I would make things and try to sell to my neighbors. And just, I was very entrepreneurial. And I thought, you know, I kind of feel like it's in my blood and... When I was in the corporate world, I made lots of money for other people. Maybe, just maybe, I could market books for myself. So I just decided I was going to go for it. And if it didn't work out, well, oh, well, at least I tried. I'd have a book in my hand no matter what. Yeah. Just, you sort of answered this question, but just because you said that the story came to you. The story came to you as an adult, being bullied as an adult, or being pushed around a lot, etc. Was there a part of you that thought to not actually write it for kids, but to write an adult novel about this kind of stuff? Because it's not just kids who need to hear it, but there's obviously who, who need to hear it. Like, Don't push other people around kind of message? That's an interesting question. I never considered it. And when I first wrote it, I didn't even think what it was at all. I just put it in a drawer. And I was like, okay, a year from today, I'm drawing a line in the sand. A year from today, I'll either be working for someone else, doing something else, or working for myself. And that was the big, scary, juicy one I really wanted, but I didn't want to tell anybody because it was terrifying. And then a year later, to the day, I was like, am I going to keep my promise to myself? Because I kept making excuses to hang on to the corporate thing. Oh, let me help them through this company event. Let me train another person. Let me hire another team member. Let me get this client on board. One thing after another, another person in front of myself. And then I said, you know, I keep my word to everybody else. Am I going to do it for myself? So I wrote up my resignation letter, gave them my two weeks and off I went. And I attended a conference, I guess, two or three weeks after that. And the very first person I met talked to me about writing and she was talking about her writing. She's like, what do you write? And I was like, oh, I'm not a writer. Yeah, I write business and marketing, boring stuff for the company that I'm not at anymore. And she's like, no, 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 you've got more. And I was like, well, I do have this little story in a drawer. She's like, tell me. So I told her what I could remember about the little rose. And keep in mind, this has been more than a year since I wrote it in the car. And she said, I just got goosebumps. You have to do something with that because my grandchildren need that message. And that's when I thought, maybe it's a children's book. And that idea was so tantalizing to me because as a kid, that's what I wanted to do. And the fact that I could probably help somebody too, so that they wouldn't go through all the drama that I went through as an adult, if they had the seed planted as a kid, I thought, oh man, wouldn't that be juicy good if I could do that? What if I could really do that? And every day I would just get in touch with that feeling. And I was like, I'm writing a children's book. That's what it is. It's a children's book. I never even considered. The fact that you stuck with children's book, it wasn't even a second thought. It was just, I know you said you had other books, but it seems like the bulk are children's books. So just because once you were there, you're like, yeah, this is it. I think I'm really an eight-year-old girl. I I, I see the world very much through my own childhood eyes. And I've always been able to do that. And I've never really valued it. I've always kind of been like a Pied Piper for kids. They've always been interested in me, even when I was scared of them. So now it all makes sense. I think once I started going to doing school visits and things like that, it depends on the grade level, but some kids will raise their hand in front of an auditorium of 800 people and tell you that they are bullied. It's amazing the courage that they have. I could never have done that. I was an adult afraid to tell somebody. (laughs) Once I started feeling their heart, I was just 
this is where I'm supposed to be. I never questioned it. I just had another idea and another idea. And then I made a board book for kids and I wrote a concept books like alphabet and counting books. And yeah. I just really want to help kids and, and adults too. I have a special place in my heart for women. I do a lot of talks for women empowerment groups and young women empowerment groups like Girl Scouts. I really want to make a difference. I want people to know that they can make a difference. I think that is the key message. I, I as a kid, thought I was just too small, grew up in a rural town, all these big crazy dreams and people are like why do you want to do that now i'm just like you could do that and more just feel at home in it right well here's the question do you wear your different color wigs when you speak to older audiences or is that only for younger audiences typically it's only for the younger but <laughs> sometimes i get a special request really <laughs> a, oh yeah i had a request it was the south bay business women's conference and they were like, oh yeah, you have to, you have to wear the pink hair. You have to. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm attending the conference all day. I don't really want to call that much attention to myself. So I literally had brown hair all day, except for when I talked and then I had the pink hair and then I changed back out of it. That's funny. <laughs> when I showed up for the American Association of University Women, they were like, where's the hair? <laughs> Bright colors are exciting, even as adults. That's the moral of that story. Yeah. When I first started out, I wasn't doing that and someone dared me to wear one to an event one day for a PBS SoCal. And I was like, okay. And I was so embarrassed, but I was having such a fun day. Like it's early in my career. I only have one book out and they were like, you know, hi, hi. Everybody's saying hi to me. And I'm like, okay. And I go to the bathroom and I'm washing my hands. I glance in the mirror. I'm like, holy cow, I'm fabulous. <laughs> forgot. <laughs> And then people are like, well, what colors are going to be next time? I thought, oh, well. <laughs> maybe I should try some more wigs on. Yeah. I end up having more fun. So it's just kind of become my thing. When you go to school visits, do you always take the little rose with you? Or do you sometimes take other books? Or that's kind of what you center your visits around? I take one of all of the books right. and I display them on a table. And at this point, my husband and I have 30 books between the two of us. So it's oh, a wow. large table. What we do is structure the talk, no matter what the group is, if it's a school or a grade level or whatever, we structure the talk for that particular audience. So of course, our origin story doesn't change. We may give more details depending on how old the folks are. But if there's an anti-bullying message that they want, then I focus on the little rose. If the message is about dealing with change and adaptability, then I focus on the little no. If the message is about becoming a writer, then I focus on author life and all the cool things that you can do in addition to the process of how an idea becomes a book. So it just depends on the audience, but I always acknowledge The Little Rose because so many people resonate with it more than any other thing I've ever done. It's always just going to be the crown jewel. I mean, there might be another one, but it seems like that's just your crown jewel. Yeah. For the princess. There you go. Just a kind of technical question. It seems like you and your husband, you're taking care of all your own writing, editing, publishing, etc. But are you stocking everything? Do you only sell through Amazon where they stock stuff for you? Technical thing. What do you do with all your stuff? So my husband has a little bit different situation. His is more of a hybrid because when I met him, he was already traditionally published. Okay. So he has a multi-book series called Scary School through mm -hmm. HarperCollins. And then he has a bilingual picture book called El Perro con Sombrero through Holt McMillan. Those books are handled completely separately from us by the traditional publisher. Yes. We still sell them at events, but we have to buy them as a distributor type situation. Yes. With our books that we produce, that we publish ourselves, we own them 100% outright. So we don't pay someone to do that for us. We are the ones who do the fulfillment, the inventory, all of that, which is a lot. Yeah. Know, that's why it's our focus, our business. We warehouse them ourselves. And then Amazon requests them need this many cases of this title or whatever. We get an order every Monday. We ship to Amazon and then they fulfill to the customer. Every Monday? Our, every Monday. Good for you. Yeah, it's a lot. When you go on vacation and everything, it's tough. But it's, sometimes it's a small order too. It depends on the time of year. And when you have a yeah. book release too. When you have a book release, then it's like big ramp up. And we do two to four releases a year. So depending on what's going on and how complicated the process is, it's been more complicated with the pandemic for sure. But with our wholesale customers, we ship direct to them and then they sell direct to the customer. It's basically how it works. You're your own warehouse, your own distributor, your own everything. You got to take care of all that. Yes, but we do also work with a distributor. We yeah. have one now, but we just started working with them. So we're trying that out as well. We try a lot of things. You're not going to know it works, I guess, if you don't. That's right. <laughs> That's going to be the next book is the business book of all the stuff that worked for you. So everyone else can get info on that. You know, I've thought about it. Oh. And I, I honestly think 
that it would expire before it was even printed. That's a good point. It is always yeah. changing. That yeah, is I mean, that's one of the fun things about this career is that consumer behavior is always evolving. And especially as someone who writes for kids, I mean, they grow up. So right. you have to constantly come up with new things for the older kids or find new audiences with the younger kids, you know? Keeps it dynamic. You never get stale. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, just actually to quickly ask, you said you have a romance out. That's an adult novel. Yes. Okay. Was there anything particular about the difference of going from writing picture books to writing a novel that was like, oh my goodness, this is not what I thought it was going to be. This is harder, easier, anything like that? Or just, you know It was what I mean? so hard. Yeah. It was so, so hard. So many yes. words. I, <laughs> the cool thing about it was that when you're writing for children of a certain age, you're kind of limited in a way. You don't want to put too many big words in. I like to put stretch words in. I write above the vocabulary list, yeah. but you don't want to write too far above it, right? And the cool thing about my children's books is they have social emotional learning messages woven into the story. So the child, as they're reading, is learning something special about themselves through the eyes of the character. And it's happening on a secondary level. So they're not even realizing that it, they're getting a message. With the, the romance book, I wanted to do the same thing. But when I first started writing it, I was like, what is this? You know? <laughs> like, this is not for kids. And it was so much harder to finish it. I mean, I'm a procrastinator anyway when it comes to editing and things like that. But man, with Cake in Bed, I had to basically say anything in my life for six months really hardcore, a little bit more than that total. But I said, for this next six month period, in order to get this book done, if it doesn't involve my book, my body or my business. So if it's not writing this book or going to the gym and taking care of myself or something to do with a business like speaking or invoicing or, you know, whatever, doing interviews, that kind of thing, then I'm not going to do it. And I literally only did things that related to those three areas of my life for six whole months. And it was hard. I turned down opportunities. Someone wanted me to go to Egypt with them and I wanted to go. But I was like, no, 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 no. I got to finish this book. I had committed to the deadline, yeah. to the publication date. And there's no way I was not going to do it. It was a lot harder. I have massive respect for people who write novels regularly. It's just, oh my goodness. Even the editing process, so yeah. much harder. When you walk into a bookstore, what's the first section you're going to walk over to? Is it either kids or romance kind of books or is it science fiction and you haven't told us that yet? Oh my gosh. I <laughs> love, love, love self-improvement. Okay. I am addicted. That totally fits. Yeah. Motivational mindset things. When I first started doing all this, I was learning from all these books that I was reading and all of these mentors that I've had and speakers that I've gone to conferences and seen. And I just collect everything that they suggested. And then I figured out, okay, this works for me. That one didn't work for me, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then I even put a journal together for myself so that I could stay on track every single day. And I called it my bliss book. And mm. then my friends were like, what are you doing to get so much done and have more fun than anybody else I know? And I'm like, well, I have this little journal thing. And they're like, well, I need that too. So I made it into a journal that other people can purchase as well, but I use it every single day. And that's what keeps me on track. And I'm hungry for it. If I listen to an audio book and whatever the new motivational stuff is coming out, I'll listen to it. And if I can find one more juicy nugget that makes my life just that much better, then it's worth it to me. I find it very inspiring hearing other people's stories. And then you secretly plant it into your kids' books. <laughs> well, I try my best. You know, it's so nice to be able to help solve problems for parents, too. During the pandemic, I had multiple parents writing to me and saying, do you have anything about dealing with fear? Because a lot of kids were experiencing being afraid of the dark. Right. And they weren't before. Right. But for some reason in the pandemic, that's how it manifested for them. Um, and I thought, I don't have anything like that. But wouldn't it be fun to write a book about a monster who's afraid of the dark? Yes, it would be fun. <laughs> and so that's what I did. Did. And then I thought, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if this book glowed in the dark? Like, <laughs> oh my! Goodness. And that's what I did. And I couldn't have done that earlier in my career. I couldn't have taken the risk on the more expensive printing and all that. Yes. But at this point, I was like, you know, I'm going to do it. It's going to hurt the profit margin a little bit, but it's so cool. Yeah. And kids love that stuff. They know when they walk up, they see the cover and they get it. They get it instantly. It's really fun when you take the courageous risk early on, but then you can take creative risks later on. It makes it worth it. You just build, 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 build. An advantage of being in charge of the whole process means that you were able to take that risk because you thought of it, so you were able to do it. You don't have to convince anybody of it, only yourself. Yeah, and I think for me, if I could share something I've learned along this way, it's so much easier 
to take these risks when you're not in debt. When I first started out, I didn't know that. I was still learning how I wanted to operate my life and my business. But now we run completely debt free. And when we do an event, we pay in cash. It's already paid for. So I don't have to stress. I don't just sit at the table and be scared that we're not going to make back the investment to pay it off because it's already done. So it's an abundance mindset, just saying like, oh, I've already invested the money. Now I can just be here and be present with my fans. I can have fun. It changes it. And I think the same thing is with the books. I didn't know this when I started out either, but when you don't have a lot of attachment as to whether someone else loves it, more people love it. It's just the energy is different about it. They're more attracted to it because you're not so dependent upon them approving you. Yes, true. Well, that's also an advantage you have having creative control of it. That you're not trying to make a lot of other people in a publishing house or whatever happy about it. Yeah. And I'm willing to take the risk. If I believe in the project, when you have 15 books, there's inevitably going to be some that don't sell as well as others. Maybe it's for a narrower niche. Maybe it's a different genre you're not used to writing in. Maybe people just don't love that whatever that animal is as much as other animals, <laughs> whatever. But it doesn't really matter because I'm creating it for me. I love it and I want that message out into the world and it's available now. And I think as authors too, sometimes, at least I did when I first started out, I was just very, very focused on that printed book, the hardcover book. But now I see the whole life cycle of the book. So it's not only the hardcover, it's eventually, if I choose to, a paperback. It's the audiobook. We create video books of our children's books. There's income opportunities in a lot of different channels that... I think sometimes we overlook and maybe they're not as tremendous as the printed book, but there's still the still monthly income that's coming in that's enabling you to create more books to get out into the world. That's very true. So much good stuff here. I'm so glad we're speaking. <laughs> well, even with all that, we do have to wrap up. So we always wrap up with a fill in the blank question of I really like it when writers, editors, publishers, books, series, stories, whatever, anything story related, do X and I really don't like X. So how would you answer or fill in the blank for each of those parts? I really love it when authors and illustrators share from the heart their success stories. I find them incredibly inspiring and I can't get enough of them. Every time I see someone doing something cool, I'm like, oh, if they can do it, maybe, maybe one day I could do that too. And I think there's a lot of hunger out there for those kinds of messages that are really, they feed us, they nourish us yeah. along the journey. Except that I started point out to stop because I was like, stop looking at the one hit wonders or the overnight wonders because yeah. that's not realistic. That's right. I've been doing this for 11 years now. And then how would you do I really don't like what or anything... I really hate it when other people say, can I pick your brain? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it is like the worst phrase ever. People don't mean to, but it comes off very entitled to me. Yeah. You know, I've worked so hard to learn the things that I've learned. And right. I would never walk up to somebody and be like, can I just take those things from you? Well, it's different. Can I have advice on this versus like, just give me the ideas in your brain. Right, right. You want to help people. And yeah. early in my career, I spent hours and hours helping people. But I found that they don't always take the advice. And it's so frustrating because it takes time to understand what someone's unique situation is and what yeah. their goals are. Because not everybody wants to run a business like I do. Some people, they just want to have a book out on the side that's out there and kind of let it be their hobby. Some people don't want to make it their whole lifestyle. So you kind of have to understand really what their goals are before you can recommend something to them. And that takes time and energy and focus. And people want the quick now thing and it's just not there. And at this point in my career, I, I can't afford to spend hours and hours on the phone with random people all the time. I need to focus on my family and my growing my own business and getting my own writing done, which is increasingly difficult. The more books you have, it's kind of like planting a garden. The more flowers you have in the garden, the more time you have to spend taking care of them. It just creates less and less of windows. So I prefer that people do not approach me and say those things, <laughs> <laughs> even though I know they're well-meaning. Just to clarify, you said that it, the writing gets more difficult. You're not saying the writing itself, just the time for writing. It's more difficult to the find. The time. It. Yeah, okay. Yes, making the time. Because like every book I have is like a child. I have to look after that that child. I have yeah. to remember to talk about that child in public. I have to nurture that child. I have to put that child into reprints and pay for it to go to college, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> all those things. And then I also have my own child now. I have a brand new baby. So you know, this life is really full and it's juicy good. And it's a matter of, of figuring out that balance over time. And I'm navigating that journey. And that's why I love other authors' stories, because I have a friend who has five kids, was in the army, 
and publishes multiple books a, a year, wow. novels. I keep thinking, you know what? If she can voice record her rough drafts in the car, commuting and dropping kids off places, there's no excuse for me <laughs> not being able to get my book done. Yeah, wow. Good for her. <laughs> That's why those stories are so important. <laughs> Put you in perspective. And, you know, we have a whole catalog of stories like that, talking to a bunch of different people. After this, everyone could go back and listen to all the other amazing people we've spoken to. With that, Sherry, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks so much for your time and thanks for being on the podcast today. You're welcome. I had a great time. Thank you. This was a bonus episode of Oh My Word podcast featuring best-selling author Cherry Feet. To find out more about Cherry and her work, please visit the link in the episode notes. To find out more about Oh My Word podcast and to keep track of all the great stuff we're up to, please follow us on Instagram at Oh My Word podcast and check us out at el Music is by Tim Burke. Thank you so much for joining us. Catch you next time.